Good evening and welcome to the X-Files here in the heart of Salt Lake City, where courageous people come forward and share their journey from the religion of Mormonism to a personal saving relationship with Jesus Christ. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I thank God for this opportunity. It's an amazing opportunity and I appreciate him so much. And I appreciate the many volunteers who, who take of their valuable time to come and assist us. Um, before we begin, I'd like to offer a, a prayer, and um, we ask Heavenly Father to bless us tonight, that the things that are said will be done with your spirit, and that we'll be able to touch and soften hearts, that people will learn something that will touch them. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to introduce tonight Kay Brown. Welcome to X-Files, Kay. Thank you. Appreciate it's great it. to be here. Well, nice to have you. And we'd like to hear a little bit about your story. So if you could share a little bit about your time as a Latter-day Saint and, and eventually coming out as a, as a Christian. So you were, you were Latter-day Saint? Absolutely, yeah. I was born and raised in Mormonism. My parents were born and raised in Mar Mormonism. And as far back as, you know, the genealogy goes yeah. here in the U.S. Yeah. Um, and even back to the Scandinavian countries where, you know, some had joined some had the Mormon joined church. back there, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I have a rich heritage. Um, I um, was active my entire life. My, my mother was very active. My dad was kind of on and off, you yeah. know, in activity, but um, he believed in the Lord. That and, happens sometimes, yeah, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and as a teenager, I, you know, I, I loved the Lord. Jesus was always the focal point. Um, I didn't know that I didn't have the the Jesus of the Bible at the time. and But my relationship was with Jesus Christ and because he's outside of time and space, yeah. you know, he's not a created being. Yeah. He shines down on, you know, he <laughs> he is there for all of us. Yeah. And so you were active as a, teen, a youth mm -hmm. and a teenager and mm -hmm. as a young adult. You, did you go to seminary? And oh, yes. I graduated from the seminary. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and uh, met my husband, married him. We were high school sweethearts. Oh, uh, boy. Yeah, we have uh, five children and 21 grandchildren now. Wow. And, yeah, so we have a large family. And we were, you know, active throughout our married life. And uh, I never had any real reason to, to question anything. I, I never would have. I, you know, I kind of bought it hook, line, and sinker. Yeah. Married, um, married in the temple. Got married in the temple, yes. And good testimony of Joseph Smith and yeah, the church yeah, and the I, leaders. I believed it. I respected Joseph Smith. I respected the leaders. Um, had I known the real history, then I would have questioned, but because so much of it is concealed um, from our eyes uh, as far as the, the true history in Mormonism, I, you know, I thought I knew Joseph Smith, I really didn't entirely, but the Joseph Smith that was presented to me as a Mormon, absolutely, I, you know, I had great respect and always honored my leaders and tried to do it. They said, watch conference on Sunday, yeah. you know, whenever it was conference yeah. Sunday. So, so yeah, we, I, I, I don't know if we were a typical Mormon family, but I guess we probably were. Sounds like you probably typical. were. I know I had a strong testimony of the gospel. I felt like what I, from what I knew at least, but it seems very selective what we do learn in the church, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, it's very, it is quite selective. And, and as I've uh, gone back and done a little bit more research, I have discovered some places where there were things concealed, um, where things were put in brackets, for instance, in lesson materials that could have told the full story, like Brigham Young and all of his wives, but right. it just said wife, but it said it in brackets because it wasn't actually contextually <laughs> true. So you know if you I mean? were actually looking, you might be able to have picked up on it, but most of yeah. us don't, right? had I known. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. But you had an in interesting experience with study. I know you mentioned uh, at one point that your son had started looking or uh, questioning the church mm -hmm. a little bit. Tell us that about that. Okay, yeah. Um, he had learned some of the real history of the Mormon church, um, mainly about polygamy, 
and also about polyandry, which was something I hadn't even heard of. Uh, it's not something ever either. that you'd be taught no. in the Mormon church. Explain polyandry then. Well, polyandry is where a woman has two husbands, and Joseph Smith actually, actually practiced uh, polyandry, he taking 11 other men's wives to be his own for time and eternity, which meant he had access to them as a husband in this life, but that they were to be his um, wives in the next life. And then he encouraged those husbands to go and find polygamous wives that would be their own. Uh, you know, in the strange in practice. the hereafter, very very <laughs> strange, yeah. So your son learned about this. He learned about that, and then he also learned about uh, masonry, and Mormonism does embrace masonry. Um, in my studies, I have actually discovered that masonry, uh, a lot of the basic things in masonry are in, done in the Mormon temple, um, and so. As he's telling me these things, I know my mouth probably just dropped open. I did not realize that uh, anything about masonry. I didn't. I didn't even know really what it was. I'd heard the term, but didn't know that Mormon Mormonism embraced it. But I have since learned through the history, yeah. uh, Joseph Smith's own history, he was a Mason. Well, I've always was always under the impression that the Masons. Uh, came from Solomon's Temple and that the rites and ceremonies that were practiced there mm -hmm. in Solomon's Temple were now restored mm -hmm. to the to the temple mm -hmm. worship. Uh, you found that isn't the case, I'm yeah, sure. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. I did go back and study some things on Solomon's Temple and did discover with that that uh, no time did they have ever <laughs> a, a, a temple of God did anything but animal sacrifice. It was all to point toward the coming the of coming and the, 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 the lamb that would be sacrificed, the son of God who yeah. would be sacrificed for us. And that was all that was ever done in the Mormon temples, yeah. or in the, excuse me, in the biblical in temples. The biblical temple. mm -hmm. And yeah. there was only one and temple was only at a time. Temple, yes. There was never more than one Mount temple. Mm -hmm. So did you learn more things then as your son was Alert. Yeah. Well, what actually happened is you began trying to study to prove him wrong. Is that yeah, true? Yeah, that is really true. I wasn't really sure um, about the things that he was sharing with me, and so I did dig into research, but I determined right from the beginning that I would not get into anything that would be considered anti-Mormon, and so I went directly to the horse's mouth, so to speak. I went to the um, church history, the one that uh, Joseph Smith wrote or had written with his scribes, which he says in those history volumes, or the, the history that I have is a seven volume set. Okay. One is, is uh, one of the books is for reference, but the others are, are you know, all the texts right. that, was, that were recorded. And so I went right to those, and I, um, when I pulled out uh, the um, volume two, page 182, that's where Joseph Smith actually gives a timeline for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was to happen around 1891. Oh, really? Because of the, I calculated the time frame from when he said it, and he specifically said about 56 years. This is what he's telling the people to prepare. Uh, and so, you know, because the, the, I'll have to read that. the Lord the Lord would be coming in, in about 56 years. Well, that would have been around, give or take, 50 or 100 years. Yeah, around 1891. <laughs> yeah, huh? and so I Whoops. discovered that it there. It didn't happen, yeah. Right. Then volume five, which I actually have right here, is um, it has several things in it that were quite interesting. Uh, one of them is the polygamy issue, and there is... Uh, writing in here that confirms that Joseph Smith absolutely did take other men's wives. He had other wives besides uh, Emma. And then another thing that's in volume five that, that I found very interesting was, and if I can find the, the pictures here of the, it's actually, I hope I can, it's, it's the Kinderhook plates. Oh. And I'll just basically tell you because yeah. I would be thumbing through here and maybe <laughs> not find it right now, but the Kinderhook plates were some little bell-shaped plates that were created by some men who did not believe that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God and wanted to prove uh, to the people around that, that, that he was he a was false prophet. False, yeah. yeah, And so the Kinderhook plates, uh, actually the LDS church has come out and says, yeah, those really were bogus. But, but the interesting thing is that Joseph actually did record in volume 5 uh, 
uh, where he had translated yeah. these plates, <laughs> and now they've been determined to be actually bogus. And so that, that's confirmation there. Yeah. Well, one of the things that struck me, both the Kinderhook plates, but also the Book of Abraham, yeah. where it uh, was where we now have the facsimiles, and I know we don't talk about it much in the church, but we have the actual facsimiles, and mm -hmm. where Joseph said this was Abraham, and this was a prophet, or this was the Elkanah, the priest, mm -hmm. and the angel of the Lord, and all that. And mm -hmm. of course, those are just not true. So. Yeah, it was an interesting story. I mean, they even drew in. Uh, the, the fragment, as I've studied it, actually was torn and came down right where that little round head is right. drawn. And that, that head was something that was drawn on. But contextually, that character would have had the elongated face because that was the dress. Head that of was a jackal or the something. The head of the jackal, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah. And so um, there, there were just so many things there. So the book of Abraham fell. Yeah. So as you studied this, uh, and did you talk to your son about your findings then? Was he saying, okay, mom, you see this? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I did. So I told he felt him confirmed and everything. Yes. And, yeah. and my husband who uh, didn't have as much time to study what I was studying, so I would share with him. And so uh, as, yeah. as time went on and, and after studying all of these things, I, I determined one time we like to camp, and so I, we were um, staying in our trailer. My husband was out kind of working outside, and, and I was in the trailer alone and uh, sitting by the window. It was noon, about, it was a nice sunny day. And this day. stuff was just bothering you probably, wasn't oh, it? Oh, yes. Just eating at you. And it was heavy, you yeah. know, I was sad. That's I was mourning. I, I was mourning because this was everything I'd ever known, and I loved yeah. my church, my, or what I thought was the term church. My, my religion, I, right. you know, and so it was like a death. Yeah, yeah. so it, my heart part. was heavy yeah. during that, yeah. uh, that time period. But I determined that, well, I thought about, well, now who will I talk to? You know, do I go talk to my bishop? I really knew that he probably wouldn't have the answers to give me or he would have already given me. It's hard to talk to others in or out of the church, well, at least in the church, about questions, mm -hmm. isn't it? Because they're kind of their antenna goes up really quick and they realize yeah. that you're not on the same page perhaps. So And I didn't at that point actually know I wouldn't have known what to say or to talk to him yeah. about really totally other than my findings. Yeah. And so I just determined that there was really only one place I could go and I needed to uh, ask God. And so that's where I was when I was sitting there okay. looking out the window. Husband's gone outside and you're yeah, alone. I'm alone. I have okay. a lone moment. And so I look out the window of our, our fifth wheel trailer and I, I see this little white cloud up in the sky and I thought, you know, God is out there. All I have to do is ask Him. And, and so I just started praying and I'm talking to Him and I just said, you know, God, I have studied all of these things and you know I have. And I said, but I really need to know, you know, What's, which what's direction true? to yeah. go. If Mormonism's true, I need to know so that I can help my son to come back to Mormonism. If it's not true, then, you know, I need to know which direction to take. And then I just uh, kind of almost uh, timidly told him, but God, I believe the negative things that I've learned about the LDS Church. It's hard to verbalize. It was hard isn't to it? verbalize, and I and it was a little fearful because you always wonder if you're going to get back. struck with yeah. lightning. <laughs> but you kind of have to step back and yeah. say, okay, I I think I'm believing this mm -hmm. uh, this negative stuff or well, what the truth yeah, really yeah. what it is. Yeah. Well, and I knew God knew. I mean, sure. I knew that much. I knew He knew my heart. So right. was I going to hide anything from Him? Yeah. No, <laughs> and so. <laughs> I just bore my heart to him and, and I just told him everything. And I had a profound sadness come over me of sorrow for my disbelief, not knowing God and not understanding him where he had it all laid out in his Bible, but I hadn't known to, you know, take it up and, and learn it and absorb it all and, and, and let God teach me. I was listening to man. And so I realized that. And when I did, I was so sad. And I just told God, I said, I am, I'm so sorry. I've hurt you. And I know I have. I'm really sorry. But I mm -hmm. said, and then I put my fingers up like this. And I'm looking out the window. And, and I said, but from this day forward, it's going to be me, Jesus Christ, and you, God, speaking to the Father. Because yeah. I didn't know the Trinity at the time. Right. And I said, I promise you. And I kind of bend down like you can't see me <laughs> out oh, the window. Looking and, through the window. Yeah, looking through the window, which is really kind of silly. But, yeah. but 
you know, and I tell him that, and, and instantly, as I'm looking out the window, off of me bursts this grayish matter, and I see it go right through the window. I see it drop down to the ground, and I'm looking out the window, and I see it kind of, it crumbles. Does the it sun crumble? hits it. It actually has edges, that, and it just falls, and it just is gone. It just dissipates. It just goes like it's gone down into the earth. <laughs> And it was just gone. I didn't know what had happened to me, but I didn't even have time to think because the very next thing that happened to me was I heard my lungs fill up, but I did not take a breath. And I heard, <gasps> and then the brightness came and it just came through the window and it just drenched me in this light. It was so bright. And, and I just, I'll tell you what, all I can tell you is what I felt is I felt love. I felt peace. I felt freedom. Like, I mean, I didn't know I wasn't free, but boy, was I free after that, because I even felt light, like I could kind of float. When that bondage came off, I felt the lightness. Is that what you felt like that was coming off, was the bondage? I, God didn't say, now, I'm taking the bondage off of you, I'm breathing into you, and I'm giving you new life, I'm and just, you're now born of the Spirit, which yeah. is, by the way, that is what happened to me. Whether people see it happen like I saw it, yeah. whether it's just a conscious understanding, no matter what happens, that is what is biblical. That is how rebirth happens. How you're born again. You are born again. There must be the two births. You're born of the water through your mother, the amniotic fluid, and you must be born of the spirit to be a child of God. You're not born a child of God because there wasn't a pre-existence. <laughs> you know. So you're you're so woven you're in your mother's again womb. In born the again. Yeah. And the first thing you felt was love. Oh yeah. Just, just an a, overwhelming and, love. And a burden lifted off. A burden lifted and freedom. I knew that I was free. And all I knew at that point was, whatever you have for me, God, I know that that's the way. I'll listen to you, and you're the only one I will listen to. And Jesus Christ is the only one I will go through. Now, did you share this with your husband when oh, he yeah. came back? What I did. What did he say? Right away. Well, you know, yeah. Were you apprehensive I, to tell him? Yeah, I was actually a little bit yeah. apprehensive, only for the fact that I didn't want to overwhelm him, and I didn't want him to think I was in that case. <laughs> <laughs> he knows I am sometimes, but... <laughs> You know, and so I wanted to be, I wanted uh, it to be the way the Lord wanted me to tell him. And um, when he, when I finally had kind of worked it through in my mind, I just, I just told him very soberly, I had this experience. This was God. God did this. Wow. This wasn't me. This is God's work. You know, I mean, I, I didn't use those exact words, but, but that's what I was portraying to him because it isn't our work. No. There's nothing we can add. How no. do we add to the pure blood of Jesus Christ on the cross? We can't. To the gift that he's given us, that's true. Yeah, yeah. So what, did, what was the next thing that happened to you? Did, was it more like uh, now, now to study the Bible or did you uh, feel like you needed to now tell the church leaders or what happened? Um, yeah, it was interesting because it was around conference time and they often will send leaders into homes, you know, to, to go around and talk to people. And uh, So we actually had an appointment with the state president and our bishop and we, we lovingly invited them into our home and we shared with them um, the experiences that we had had. We told them basically soberly again. We, we didn't have anything to lord over them. They have the same opportunity. Yeah. You know, there wasn't any, it wasn't a competition, you know, because yeah. God doesn't favor one over the other. We just told them. We, we just told the state president and we told the, the bishop what had happened and what, what we believed and what we were now, what we had learned. Mm. We wanted to save them, help, yeah. the, help them to open their eyes to let the spirit save them. Okay. Yeah. And did it make any difference to them? Um, <laughs> You know, in God's time, hope maybe seeds we been pray. Planted or yeah, something. we hope. We didn't see the fruit. Yeah. You, we don't always see the fruit of our, of our. You know. So you made a little transition then out of the church, mm -hmm. and uh, did you start going to a, a Christian church, yeah. or you opened the Bible and you started reading? What uh, What was your next step? Well, we were camping again, okay. and our son was there, okay. and uh, he asked if we wanted to go to a little church there in uh, Ephraim, a little Christian church. And I said, yeah, I want to go. And so I went with and you him. And you had been before? You hadn't been to it? Never had stepped foot in a different church. Why would I? Yeah. I had it all. Had it all. The true <laughs> church. Huh? Yeah. So what happened? So I, I actually, um, we walked into this little church and, and um, they're up there with guitars. 
So and little drums. A little different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I were, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, okay, okay, well. And it was beautiful music. And as we stood in there and the words were up on this, a screen, um, started singing, every word was about the Lord. Every word was about God. It was, there was nothing praise to the man. <laughs> there, there was nothing uh, void of the Spirit of God. And I stood there, my son and I both, and we, we cried. We, we stood there and just blubbered. I mean, yeah, I was just sobbing. And I noticed the young pastor up there, he was sobbing too, because he knew that, that this was very touching for us. And, and he was crying. And he was crying. And there were people around us c crying too. And, and we were like, yeah, yeah, isn't this great? This is the most wonderful thing in the world. And um, then he began to preach. And guess what he talked about? I can't imagine. <laughs> talked about Jesus, I'll bet. Yeah, he told the story of Abraham and how, how God never commanded. Uh, he never used the term polygamy, but the gist of it was, it was basically their, their uh, lack of faith. Sarah, and you know, I don't, I don't hold anything against people like Sarah, you know, she, yeah. she did the best she could. God had promised they would have a child. Here she was old and, you know, she wasn't about to maybe have a child in her, in her mind, yeah. but God can do anything. And um, she gave the handmaid and it wasn't a marriage, it wasn't polygamy. Yeah. There never was anything like that. It was all, every time you hear about even Jacob when he took uh, Leah, for the first wife, that was something that was arranged by the father-in-law. It wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't God's it wasn't doing. That polygamy was commanded no. or anything. No. So, did you attend another church after that and experience similar? Yeah, similar we visited. Things? Yeah. We visited a few different ones. You know, um, the nice thing is, is that you're not giving a, given a section of uh, real estate where you've got to stay within that area, <laughs> and so you can go and visit um, different churches. Yeah. Um, and the term church. This is important for. This was important for me to learn as an LDS person. The term church doesn't have anything to do with an organization. The term church is comes from the word, I believe, uh, ecclesiastes or something, something like to that, that effect. Yeah. And, um, and so it's the group of believers. So whenever you read in the Bible the word church, it's talking about the group of believers. And there were... You know how, I have to tell you something about the book of Revelation that just I just learned, and I'm sure that the Holy Spirit just opened this up to me. In the book of Revelation, there are seven churches talked about, and it was the, it was the churches in that the, originally, the seven area, churches, yeah. mm -hmm, in, the, in the various areas, uh, after Christ had come, the, right. the groups of believers were set up in different places, you know, and... When it's talked about in the book of Revelation, what it's doing is showing that the body, bodies of believers all... Make up the body of Christ. It makes up the body of Christ, but it also uh, shows that, that Christ's church, His gospel, lived on past Him. There was no need for a restoration. That's pretty key, isn't it? Pretty key yeah. because there, you know, that's the whole of Mormonism. Yeah, that's uh, that was a big concept for me too because I assumed the church was the only true church, and I think one mm -hmm. of the sad things is that the Mormons, and especially those that might be questioning, really don't know where to go, or what where to turn, and some yeah. of them turn agnostic or become atheist, you know, don't believe yeah. in anything because they, they don't trust maybe Christianity because of what they've been taught in the church. I'm so glad to hear your story about going into your church and uh, crying at the first time. The well, first time we went to a church up in Brigham City, we, we walked in and there were um, little boxes of tissues around and I thought, well, this, that's kind of interesting. Uh, why is the, <laughs> where's the crying in here? And yeah. It wasn't, but a few, uh, you know, 20, 30 minutes later, I, everybody's popping them out because people yeah. are sharing such sincere, heartfelt testimonies about Jesus, and it's all about Him. It's all about so Him. Tell us how you, how you view now the Bible compared to your time as a, a Latter-day Saint and now as a Christian. Well, I read the scriptures. We were admonished to read the Book of Mormon, and so I'd read all of them. I read, read them like a novel from beginning to end, and I read the Bible beginning to end. But... I never could understand, or I, I should say my eyes had not yet been opened to be able to see um, 
what was truly is the that, messages. Is that a true statement that eyes can statement. be opened or can be, I guess, differently be closed? Absolutely. You think your yes. eyes are closed as a Latter-day Saint? I do absolutely believe that, and I've had a couple of experiences where, where I know that that's the truth. Um, and when I had the rebirth experience, one of the first things I noticed that was different about me is when I looked out at the mountains that were around us, it was like a cloud had lifted. I was seeing detail I didn't even know was there before. So literally my eyes had been opened. Wow. But so everything now that is laid open that is truth can be perceived. And that, that is a real thing. I mean, look at Paul, the Apostle yeah. Paul. He had the scales fall from his eyes. I know now that's, that was very literal. And that's what happened to you. Absolutely. So now the Bible scriptures mean so much more. And I understand them grace now. Grace yeah. and Jesus and his sacrifice. And, mm -hmm. All of uh, that. That's all wonderful. of that. And, and knowing about the Dead Sea Scrolls has helped a lot too because the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, some of the, the, those date back to the first century A.D., which means that was just shortly. I mean, yeah. that was when the apostles wrote them down. And so... And they've come forward they've just come forward. beautifully. That's the testimony that came forth. Uh, the original 12 apostles were all that was needed because their, t their testimony lives on. And, yeah. uh, and Jesus was the final high priest. He was the final sacrifice. high priest. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Oh, well, that's wonderful. So your relationship with the Savior's different now than it was? Completely different because um, it's open. You know, when Jesus said to tell us die on the cross, which means paid in full yeah. or it, it, it is, is finished, finished, God tore the veil from the top to the bottom. The temp he just, the temple, the temple veil. veil. Yeah. And when that was torn, there was no longer a need uh, for us to go through a temple like you would in the Mormon religion. He was the final sacrifice. It was the final so. sacrifice. It was done. It was finished. That opened the way for us directly to God. Yeah. There's no man you have to go through to please, to, you know, to follow direction. Mm -hmm. Well, Kay, thanks so much for sharing your testimony. And I know we Thank had you. some other things that we even wanted to bring up. We talked about some parallel counterfeits of, of Satan and how he's he seems to parallel just the truth, just enough to make it uh, a, a deception and, and deceive. And, and that's his goal, that is, is to his keep goal. us in the dark. Or if it's something that's pure and true, he changes it just enough so that it, uh, it, it appeals to our human flesh, mm -hmm. which is what we are here on the earth, sinful and, and mm -hmm. flesh creatures, but he distorts it just enough to make it appeal to us. And it ring, so, it'll ring true, Yeah, you know, truth. some of the things. And that's how he deceives as he takes a little bit that way. But, yeah, that parallel, Yeah, it's well, th Satan's work. Thanks again, or Kay. I appreciate it. Thank you. For those of you that are LDS and are questioning, feel free to contact us, us at exmormonfiles.tv. We'd love to answer or help any questions. Good night.